for people that aren't familiar with Vidar, give them the, you know, the the, sh the, the spiel. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, the or, or the convention pitches. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But especially like after a long day, it's just kind of on a loop, right? Um, <laughs> so Vidar uh, is a game that is focused on uh, random storytelling as, as best I can. It's my interpretation of that. So it takes place in a town with 24 different people, and every night a random one of these villagers is killed by a beast. Uh, and they all have very interdependent lives. So when one person dies, everyone else's stories kind of go akimbo, and everyone else's stories change. Um, so if the blacksmith loses a supplier or loses her, you know, apprentice or she predeceases both of them, uh, what her needs, what everyone else's needs are will change as the game evolves. Uh, and then in order to stop the beast, you go into a puzzle dungeon, um, which recently, especially at conventions, I've kind of been pitching as like Zelda with no combat. Uh, very, like, use your environment to solve, you know, environmental puzzles, use your tools, use the things in the room uh, to help you get from point A to point B, to get from the beginning of the room to the end of the room. And those are all also randomized, so that way if you want to see a new story, you're, you don't come back thinking, yeah, but I solved this puzzle already and I remember it. Um, so that's, that's kind of the basic gist of it, is uh, try, to, try to stop this beast from killing everyone in town before uh, all 24 are dead. It seems like a pretty good, pretty good thing to do, you know, stop the <laughs> yeah. town from getting wiped out. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we first met at the 2014 FIC. Boston yes. Festival of Indie Games. So that was two years ago. So the reason we're really doing this interview is because you've hit alpha. Yes. Um, and so to lead into that, you know, kind of looking back at that two years now, like alpha is a really big milestone for you, of course. What, what, is, how has um, Vidar changed over that time, and how has it like your perception of the game itself kind of changed? Yeah, uh, it's changed a lot over that time. So when I actually applied to Boston Fig. Um, I had not even met uh, or spoken with Becca Bear, who is the artist for the game. Um, and I was, the app, my like demo that I used to apply for it used only RPG like default assets, RPG Maker, sorry, uh, default assets that ship with the engine. Um, and that if you've played a lot of RPG Maker games, like you know them instantly on site. Um, and I had somewhere in the interim between, like, once I got accepted, I was like, crap, I gotta, like, find an artist and I gotta get real about this. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like, that was the first debut of her art at all um, at, at Boston Fig back in 2014. Um, that was more or less a glorified tech demo. It was, you know, like, what can I do? I'm, you know, here's the systems that I put in place to see if this is really feasible to do. Uh, the way that I want to do it, and uh, and let's see what kind of a vertical slice is in that uh, in that system. You know, so what is one in-game day? Right. Um, since then, uh, I I've made a lot of changes to what I had in in my head and and as designed for the sake of um, making it a fun game. I mean, so before. <laughs> There was, uh, you know, like one of the biggest changes for me was before there was this idea that you would just have to try and go as far as you can in the cave every day. So like you would have 10 minutes, just solve as many puzzles as you can, and hopefully by the end of 24 days, in game days, then you would be at the end. Um, and what I found doing a lot of these, I, I think I came to Boston Fig, I think, way earlier than a lot of people in terms of the development stage were at. Um, and that has only, I think, benefited me. And I've done a lot of similar things in New York and, um, you know, down, back down in too many games in uh, Philly, which I think is going on like now-ish. Um, and there's a, there's a few others. Uh, and seeing people play through kind of more of what I had in mind of the actual progression of the game, I noticed that as a result of people feeling so pressured to get as far as they could in those 10 days, they were not, or those 10 minutes, they weren't... Um, stopping to like do any of the classes or anything like that. And that's where all the story is and right. that's where it all lives. So, uh, and then also there was a lot of backtracking that was happening as a result. So, um, completely restructured how all of the, that, those mechanics interact um, to give the player more breathing room to actually experience the story and experience the class. Um, to actually get immersed in that story that you've you've put in there, sure. Exactly, exactly, because that was really really the selling point of the game. Um, and then the you know 
in terms of what I see the game as being has also, you know, originally it was, well, let's just like look at, at how all of these kind of plot lines interact. Um, and, and over the past few years, the theme has really coalesced how, you know, these stories are supposed to evolve has really, uh, and, and still tell kind of this, or, or evoke the same kinds of emotions has, has developed a little bit more as well. So those have been, for me, I mean, looking back on it is kind of crazy to like i still have every so often as i'm like looking for bugs i find artifacts of old code and <laughs> and i am completely self-taught i taught myself how to code about like two and a half years ago <laughs> uh, so some of the stuff that like I'm, I'm digging up like i'm like why is this crashing here and i look at it i'm like who wrote this <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. um so so uh it's it's been especially recently because i've been having to go back and look at older stuff um a, a good chance to reflect on it yeah sure. <laughs> um so i wanted to touch on alpha and kind of why you ch first how you're doing alpha because i know you've kind of got a, a system you're using yeah um, and i thought it would be an interesting thing to kind of talk about from a development standpoint of now that you're at that stage where you're letting other people see it, you're opening it up to alpha, how are you doing that and why have you decided to do it that way? Yeah, so um, on, there, there's a ton of different considerations here, but I can start at the end, which is to say um, I'm basically very slowly well, releasing like 10 a week, like Steam keys to, I started with friends and family, and then I'm going through the Kickstarter backers kind of from uh, top down. Um, and to get more into the nitty gritty of it, I'm specifically targeting the people who have requested Windows, Steam keys. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I offered as Kickstarter, I know that some people, I personally, like I'm a Steam devotee, mm -hmm. uh, I don't care about the DRM co components of it. I like having all my games in the same place. That's my, my shtick. Uh, but I get that other people do. So I wanted to make sure on the Kickstarter that there were those options. Right. Um, that being said, uh, it's much easier to patch through Steam. Um, now that I've gone through the Greenlight uh, gauntlet uh, and can just issue a Steam key and then like re upload a build, I don't have to be in a situation where I'm like, hey guys, I found like one bug. Uh, everyone go re-download this from my yeah. website, something like that. And I have not built any kind of patch system myself, so uh, I'm starting there. Um, then, uh, but the reason that I've kind of done this is, uh, one, I promised my Kickstarter backers that I would have the, give them something uh, March of this year, uh, and I was totally wrong on that estimate. Um, but I want to make sure I want to, you know, get them something. I want to make sure that Kickstarter backers have they're an important part of the community, sure. and, and I want them to have a game in hand as soon as possible. Um, I get that some people won't play it until it's finished. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't a way of, you know, saying, oh, well, I got them something good enough, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, right. You're not just checking <laughs> off the list, right. Right, right. But uh, for some people, you know, making sure that I'm checking in with Kickstarter backers and saying, hey, I haven't forgotten about you. Hey, you know, you guys are really, you guys are what got this off the ground um, is important to me. So that's where I want to start. At the same time, uh, I don't want to give everyone a Steam key right off the bat because I know um, that I will get, you know, uh, 500 reports of the same bug in the first five minutes of the game. And uh, I remember, you know, I, I know certainly from my perspective, if I have a game that I'm playing in early access and it's a little bit buggy or something like that, or I've invested a lot of time and then it crashes, um, I don't come back to it. And so I don't want to lose potential testers uh, to the same bug. That's clever. <laughs> I'll lose them to different bugs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's kind of why I wanted to talk about the way you're rolling out Alpha, because um, in reading the dev blogs you put out about that, I thought that that was really an interesting consideration that I hadn't seen other places of the customer base loss based on a single bug. And, and if you can you know, catch that early with five people in your right. total audience as opposed to 500, right. it's, exactly. it's an interesting thought. Exactly. So, you know, the, the whole, and, and obviously the people who are testing, you know, know, like when I talk alpha, I'm not talking about like some, oh, I'm basically at release and there's just a few like extra like polishes or something like that. Like the game is, is now pretty stable. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm one man and uh, this is a, you know, um, 
uh, this is a, a pretty early alpha. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, you know, it's, it's playable, but I want people to know, like, hey, if you're looking for, like, a, just a full game experience yeah, that's, like, super it. polished, all the kind of, do not play it, <laughs> not at all. Um, but if you're, you know, these are people who, then who are playing that are interested and willing to help in the testing process. And I just want to make sure that to the, as, if I have them only for, you know, a half an hour or an hour or something like that, I want to make that feedback as valuable as possible to me. Um, so one is the loss of, of them, and the other is just to make sure that they're catching different things, um, particularly with Vidar, which is so uh, randomized, and as a result, uh, there's certain elements of it that are difficult to test. You know, I can force it to do a lot of the things that I need to test, but, uh, you know, sh seeing all of the different interactions, sometimes there's just something I didn't catch or didn't think about. Sure. Um, so in that regard as well, it's important for me to have people kind of, you know, going through at a slower pace so that I can catch certain things and, and fix them if possible. So, yeah. Right, that makes sense. Um, I had on my on my list of questions. I was, you know, when I was kind of prepping to talk to you, what are you, what are your hopes for Alpha? But I imagine that's pretty, you know, explanatory. You want to have people test it and I want people to the next, it. you know, <laughs> get to the next phase. Um, yeah. So I'm more interested in kind of like what you're thinking about as a timeline. Like, where do you draw that line from going from Alpha to Beta? Yeah. That's a tough question. Um, for me, what I want to do, you know, the first and most, and, and as bugs are coming in, I'm kind of categorizing them in different buckets also. Um, you know, stability things or progress blocking things got to get fixed like right away. So, uh, but things that are like, oh, the text is kind of blocking this one person in this one cutscene. I'm like, yeah, it's on the list, but like, we'll deal with it. <laughs> Not top priority, right. It's, exactly. And it may be the case that some of those, you know, are still lasting, you know, the, even you know, moving into a beta. Um, but what I want to, you know, make sure for a beta is that it has um, all of the features that I had promised, um, even if not every single quest is in, even if not every single line of dialogue is in or something like that. Um, and, uh, you know, and that it's playable and fun. Um, part of this, you know, there's only so many people who have played kind of this version, this iteration of that are. And, uh, you know, I know that the, the question, what are you hoping to get out of alpha, is, is kind of answers itself. Mm, but one right. thing for me really is like, is it good? <laughs> is this a good game? <laughs> and, um, and to the extent that there needs to be iteration on, you know, similar to what I had done in terms of the structure of how all these different kinds of mechanics work together, I'll do it, you know, if that's what's required to, to make it a more interesting game. So that's top of my mind. Um, and then for me, really, uh, the next step, I'm like 80% convinced uh, that I'm going to go the early access route on Steam. Um, I think that uh, typically RPGs don't work so well uh, as an early access concept because an RPG, you, when you think of like some big grand story of like, 40 hours or something like that's you're gonna play it once you want right. to see it when it's done the you know right. and all that kind of stuff um and so those tend to the the early way of doing rpgs tends to be more episodic um mm -hmm. for me vidar is to, is all about replayability in fact mm -hmm. one thing that i'm kind of uh trying to scale back on is the length because it was running it was playing long mm -hmm. uh and i felt like people who played through it you know as seven or eight hour game wouldn't necessarily immediately come back and say, I want to try again and see a different story. Right, you know, invest that time again, sure. Yeah, so uh, so because Vidar is designed to be a shorter, repeatable experience like that, um, I, I think it makes more sense for early access. I can always go in and add more events, more more quests, and, and more interactions within the 24 for people to see, uh, to play out. Um, and more puzzles as well, so that it's it's constantly evolving in that direction too. Um, so with that in mind, what I'm hoping to get out of Alpha and, and kind of the timeline going forward is when I think it's ready for early access. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and that's I mean, there's so much out there in terms you know from from a development perspective of like, listen, early access really is your launch day. You don't really buy yourself two launch days. You get a little bit of bump when you come out of early access, but it's not the same. Right. Um, and so you need to put your best foot forward. It's not 
a buggy alpha. It can't be. It needs to be like a near finished product, uh, mm -hmm. or certainly a stable product that has as much of the you know content that you possibly can get in there. Um, so that's that's kind of the the future for this, the forecast. Well, yeah. It's cool to hear. It's cool to see that that scope from from where you've started to where you're at and, and kind of look, <laughs> having been able to follow that process is a, is a cool window into the whole development process. Um, so shifting gears from talking about Vidar, yeah. you know, you're at with that and the whole discussion of Alpha. Um, I'd like for you to share your story on how you got into indie dev because that's kind of our whole deal is, is you know, who's the person behind the game? So right. how did you get to be into indie development? Uh, now, I've, I've heard I, this before, but I, it's a good story. <laughs> I have been, um, I mean, I've been making games in one form or another for a good chunk of my life. I got really involved in, like, the StarCraft 1 uh, map editor mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and have really involved, like, putting together games for friends. I've done, like, board games for, like, school projects instead of, like, book reports and stuff. Um, and, and coming from that game... Game, liking to make uh, games that, that friends can play perspective, um, coupled with the fact that uh, when my husband and I got married, we had a kind of like video game themed wedding. Um, no costumes. Uh, I was very anti-costume. <laughs> but uh, we definitely had like a lot of video game influences. And one of the things that I wanted to do uh, was have a game that people could play as like part of our invitation. Um, so I made a game in RPG Maker. Uh, that was where you had to play as our wedding party, and you had to save us, to, you know, from from some evil that was preventing us uh, from from getting to the wedding in time. <laughs> um, and I learned a lot about the engine in that process. I really, you know, um, the, the game was like a piece of crap, but <laughs> <laughs> and I think like maybe three people downloaded it <laughs> from the website, but um, but I was happy that we had it. Uh, and I I as a Part of going through that process, it took me about a year to put together, but as a part of going through that, I learned a lot about the engine, I learned a lot of, about just game design in general, um, and I uh, wanted, I, I had in the back of my mind, hey, I kind of want to do like another game in this engine knowing what I know now, right? Yeah. So uh, a little while later, I had kind of come up with the idea for Vidar, um, and uh, at some point I was like, I think that I want to see this with real art rather than, you know, uh, this was right around the time of, of the Boston Fig from, from 2014. And I said, you know, uh, this, I think it just needs it. I think it needs like a different aesthetic and everything. Um, and I'd like to hire an artist. And my husband was like, well, that's fine, but you better sell your game then. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Somebody else to, to do the art for it. I was like, okay, fair enough. Uh, and that's how I ended up uh, in this position. Um, and uh, since then, it's been insane. I mean, the, I'm, I'm now teaching game design uh, through play, playcrafting. I teach RPG design as well as RPG Maker. Um, I, you know, last time I saw you was up at PAX East, which was like I, two years ago. If you had told me I would have had a booth at PAX East, I would have like punched you in the face. Like, I'm like, there's no way that, that would have happened. Oh, no, you're, you're in there. I mean, you're, you were right next to uh, Chuck Carter, who we just interviewed. Yeah, Which is kind of yeah. funny that how that that's all lined up, but yeah, that was uh, I mean, it was great that um, that was through playcrafting, which is the group that I teach with, um, and uh, it's I mean, it's a small dev world, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's crazy to to be a part of it now. So yeah, it, yeah, it's it's a fun <laughs> story. I I love hearing that. Um, so f we also like to ask two questions of anybody okay. that we're interviewing. The all first right. being. What other games are you playing? You know, and I mean, of course, yeah. as a dev, you know, when you find time to play it. But what what games do you enjoy playing? Like as yeah. a gamer, it's it's funny. Um, like normally, when I get asked that question, I'm like, oh, so I'm playing this, not the other thing. And like now, it's like, no, really, Vidar. Like I'm playing so <laughs> much Vidar to test it. <laughs> um, but no, I play I play plenty of other stuff. Uh, I. Um, Let's see, right now, uh, so there's a, a Twitch streamer, her name is Anna Kale, um, she goes by Geek Girly Gaming, um, who I actually met also at that same Boston fig uh, in 2014. Um, and she ended up playing Vidar on her stream, and I've kind of become involved in her community a little bit. Um, so as a result, like they, everyone has recently started playing Ark, so I've been playing Ark with a lot of the people yeah. from her, her uh, stream. 
Um, but it is small world. She was she was based in Boston and uh, she was some of the Boston big games. So I was like, all right, sweet. Um, so I've been playing a fair amount of that. Uh, I re-launched uh, Witcher Three because I hadn't uh-huh. played that in a while, and I didn't get nearly as I I played all the way through Witcher One, all the way through yep. Witcher Two when they came out. And Witcher 3, like, got the best of me, because it's, in part, I think, you know, like, I'm older, I have less time to play, uh, and then it's just huge. <laughs> so I know, that's the thing, I, I was, I started with the Witcher series, the books, actually, and, and I played Witcher 1 and Witcher 2, and yeah. I have yet to touch Witcher 3, because I know, once I go there, I'm, I'm gone to the world, like, it's just yeah. gonna eat me. It's, it's... And, and I was like, you know, when I had put it down, because I bought it when it came out, and I played it for quite a while, I put it down to around like 40, 45 hours. Um, and then I was like, you know, reading about the expansion that had just come out recently and all that kind of stuff. Wow, 40 hours in, I didn't even make it like a third of the way through the main plot. Like, <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> um, so every you know few weekends, I, I, I pick that back up. Um, and then uh, my husband has been playing a lot of Enter the Gungeon, and I've been watching watching that I can't I'm not like fast enough to play bullet hells um but uh I've watched enough of it that it feels like I'm playing it regularly yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. so those are, those are the pretty much the ones on the list yeah <laughs> um finally we like to ask if there's another indie developer out there that you think is doing something really innovative that is worth people checking out um kind of at any stage but you know we just like to yeah. See what devs find interesting that other devs are doing. It's tough to limit it to one. You don't um, have to limit it to one. I, you pick I a couple. You do. Uh, okay. The first person I'm going to say is uh, Francisco Gonzalez. He does. Um, he has that Wadget Eye game. Mm-hmm. Um, and they do a lot of point and clicks. Um, and he recently released a game called Shardlight, uh, which is on Steam. It's a point and click, it's like a post apocalyptic setting. Um, for me, it captures, you know, uh, in other t- at other times I've talked about how uh, important Paper Squeeze was to me because it was able to tell a large story that was uh, a small in scope. So, like, it created a, a grand story, but you were in a very small space. Um, I think that Francisco has done the exact same thing here, which is you are one person in this world. We're not dealing with a lot of this world building or, like, you know, kings and queens and all this kind of stuff. Um, but you get the sense in a, in a great way of the story beyond you um, and that it's not just about you. Right. Uh, and, and so from a narrative perspective, I think that that's, it's, he's, he's knocked it out of the park there. Um, uh, I'm going to say uh, Quentin Rodriguez, and let me, let me see what his studio name is. Zappling Studios. So they're doing a mobile game. They're doing a mobile game called Justice Royale, and it's uh, it's a brawler, mm-hmm. a very typical arcade brawler like that you might have played like at the movie theater when you were a kid. Um, but it's for mobile, and so like I you know I played it on iPad for example. Sure. Um, and the way that they've done the controls, uh, that it just makes it feel exactly like those big arcade machines. Like yeah. The- on one of those, but you're on an iPad, so like you're moving your thumb as, the, and it feels like as though you're moving like an actual, do- and you've got like your uppercuts and your blocks and your, da- and it just sure. feels, it, like controls for a brawler are so important, yeah. and I feel like what they've done is develop something where they could make like a million of these things <laughs> because because the controls are so it, fun on an iPad, um, and I know that like. We, when we're talking about like indie devs and like controls, controls are like kind of boring. But I really think that what they've done is really cool. No, it's it's uh. it's cool when you find a game that does something um, so different with their controls. Yeah, yeah, that really stands out. Um, and I just think that they've done something very created something brilliantly intuitive. Mm. Um, and then uh, Matt Shell, who also goes by Matt Mirrorfish, um, is doing a game called Monarch Black. Um, and it is a flight sim where you are a butterfly and you're fighting against other butterflies to collect pollen. Uh, That's and it's cool. procedurally generated and it has, the reason that I love it is just for its aesthetic. Like it has such a clear artistic point of view. Um, it feels very modern and sleek. Um, all of these levels, even though they're procedurally generated, are 
gorgeous. Mm. Uh, and the, the music, but the combination of the visuals and the music just like sets a very clear uh, tone for the game that uh, I would love to be able to replicate. So <laughs> um, those, those three, I mean, and I can't help but be biased that all three are in New York, right? <laughs> the best place to make games <laughs> is West Coast. And, uh, uh, but all of them like are, are you know, definitely inspiration for sure. now. So, yeah. Awesome suggestions. Well, Dean, thank you so much for taking a little time to talk yeah, to us. Yeah, for having me on. Yeah, of course, and we'll keep everybody in the loop on Vidar, and please keep us in the loop as it goes through Alpha and gets out there into the big wide world. <laughs> Definitely. It's like, oh my god. <laughs> it's a big deal. I'm, I'm very excited. So Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Take care.